Hello everyone, my name is uh, Dean, I'm Director of Human Resources uh, here at the Trust. I'm uh, hosting our Friday uh, report out. This is where we showcase some of the improvement uh, activity that we've got going on uh, around the Trust. I think we're trying to uh, connect one or two people in via video screen and FaceTime and things, so hopefully they'll join us at uh, some point. But if we get straight underway, we've got a busy program. Uh, so I think we're going to get uh, Stephen uh, Bailey coming up first, uh, doing the um, Necafema pathway. Stephen. So, hello everyone. My name is Steve Bailey. I'm the service manager for trauma related services. Introduce my colleagues. Uh, I'm Jonathan Lockhart. I'm the service manager for theatres and anesthesia. And I'm Diane Armstrong. I'm one of the senior assistants on the wards in TRS. Okay, so I'm here to talk about our fraction neck of femur pathway. Um, this is a pathway that's been discussed in various um, ways for a number for quite a while. What we decided to focus on um, was the theatre aspect, so we're having a lot of theatre delays, um, which was leading to poor performance with uh, best practice tariff, um, a lot of frustration between the team. So we, not to play the blame game, but there was a lot of kind of feeling of oh, it's theatre's fault, it's the porter's fault, it's the ward's fault, etc. Um, so, in terms of our data collection, um, we compiled some audits over a three-week period, um, looking at exactly what the issues were, as well as investigating some of the data that's available, including Theatre Pro, um, and looking at cart times, etc. So, our baseline figures. So, the first thing I should say is... Theatre theater 15 should start at 8.30 in the morning. Um, so the average time the first patient was confirmed was at three minutes past eight, um, but the average time that the first patient was actually sent for was 8.32, so we're already um, behind the time that we should be starting. Therefore, the number of times the first patient arrived at 8.30 was zero, um, unsurprisingly. And we were, we were losing on average 28 minutes in terms of the average time that the first patient arrived in the anaesthetic room. Um, although there were days where it was up to 20 past nine, um, so obviously a lot of time wasted. So, so, yeah, I went and spent some time on the wards doing some of the detailed time observations there. Um, I used my start point as when a porter or a theatre member of staff arrived on the ward to collect the first patient, and we found there were numerous reasons for the delays. Um, amongst them, doctors still writing in notes, so we couldn't take notes and send the patient to theatre. The ward staff hadn't fully completed the theatre paperwork. They were waiting until theatre arrived to finish some of the checks. Patients without two wristbands on, only wearing one, so we were having to print off wristbands. Some patients hadn't had their morning medications when they arrived to collect them for theatre. Another patient needed a catheter, ECGs patient who needed oxygen, we didn't have oxygen on the ward to take them. There was some confusion with one patient who had an insulin infusion running and no one really knew who needed to escort that patient and that led to a big delay that morning. And then the simplest things of a patient who needed the toilet as staff are out to take them. Um, on average this contributed to a delay time of eight minutes per day when we averaged it out. Um, we also highlighted some other issues that could be contributing to the delays but weren't specifically on the days we collected data. Not all the wards had access to the theatre list, so they couldn't actually see who was listed first and prepare that patient. And there was a lack of consistency around roles and responsibilities Hello. relating to theatre preparation. There was some confusion as to whether the night staff should be doing all the theatre checks or whether the day staff should come on and finish some of those checks. We also, one of the things I found interesting in, in doing the detailed time observation was you could see some of the behaviours changing amongst the staff. They were rushing to try and get things done. There was some healthy competition and when I went on the wards, they were asking, did we do better than that ward did that morning? So already they were trying to improve things while I was there, spending time with them. 
So from a first perspective, when we started doing the observations, it was quite clear quite quickly that um, everybody did their own different way. So it's depending on who's the theatre coordinator for the day, the way that we would approach them, the trauma meeting in the morning was different. So some some people should attend the trauma meeting at 8 o'clock in the morning. Some coordinators would go down. They would use their personal mobile to text to say that this is the first patient to confirm to theatre 15 who would then start things rolling. Other people wouldn't do that and they would wait till the meeting had finished, obviously to walk, then walk up to theatres and, and tell the staff what's going on. So obviously that whole, I guess, variation in the process slows things down. Um, the surgeon um, has to leave that meeting in order to, to do the list and theatres tended to leave a little bit earlier but the surgeon would stay for a lot more of it to discuss some of the other cases that they've got going on in the hospital. So obviously no surgeon means that we can't start our team brief, it means we can't, can't get cracked on. Um, there were some delays around um, non-suitable patients, so uh, patients who needed a total hip rather than a, a, a hemiarthroplasty for, for their replacement, which needs a consultant, which means that we couldn't then get started. Um, there was We have a, a golden patient criteria in the trust that we weren't necessarily following, so we were missing some of those stuff, so they might not necessarily be appropriate for anaesthetic. Um, there was a whole, whole heap of, I guess, various different reasons from getting ready that, that caused a bit of confusion. Um, so some of, some of the others related to the anaesthetist again was that they needed a job plan from 8 o'clock. Um, so getting in, finding out where that patient is and what ward, where they are, what bed they're in, and then going to see them and then expecting the patient then to get up for 8.30 to start the list was also uh, an impossible task. Um, and then the, the CARPS process. Um, so we have a, sometimes we log it through TMS onto CARPS, which is our data management system and sometimes we log it, log it directly through through the CARP system. There's a small delay if you log through TMS because it basically you've got to go from TMS to CARPS to then log the request so you get a longer delay in, in your porters arriving on the ward. Um, and on average it, it sort of slowed things down by about 18 minutes. So we had to do obviously a number of things to reduce both the variation on the ward, you know, the theatre practice, the anaesthetic practice and the surgical practice. So the aims that we sort of set ourselves were to have the patients in the anaesthetic room ready to start for 8.30 um, to operate on four patients per day consistently um, and in to, to improve BPT um, by improving face efficiency. So that was the 36 hour target that uh, Steve <coughs> talked about right at the start. So from a face perspective, obviously we tackled the variation in, in what we do in the initial instance. We, um, we got a trauma mobile, so rather than having um, personal mobiles to text, they had a trauma mobile with, that they could use, which also improves our business continuity plan and our resilience for any major accidents and things like that. So it had a, uh, an off on effect. We use some of the um, lease improvement methodology, uh, I guess framework and paperwork. So we use the standard work process to develop our, our theatre process to make sure that people followed the process the same way every time um, to a set of, of time standards. So I guess the most significant improvement that we made was that we actually now don't send for a patient based on the trauma meeting at all. So we, we've seen that as a waste and we use the uh, registrar overnight. They populate the list by 6 a.m. in the morning, it should be accurate. Um, and at 10, 10 to 8, we send for the patient based on that list, rather than waiting for the, the consultants to sort of argue who, who would be the first patient. Because what we found is we could have done the first patient by the time we waited for someone to argue over who the first patient is going to be, and they can then be the second patient. Um, also, Nick Freeman's not here today, but Nick did a, a huge bit of work around um, communicating with the registrars about what is a suitable first patient. So he, said he made a set of clinical criteria about who's suitable to be the first patient, communicated to the reg. Um, we have a process now where uh, if the first patient changes after 6 a.m. in the morning, the reg will bleed theatres or call the theatre mobile um, and obviously update us to say that this patient has changed for X, Y, and Z so that we don't bring the patient down to find out that uh, they're not there. Um, the other thing we've done is we now have um, a pre-wait in PACU, so the patient can come down and they'll be in the back of PACU for, I think the average time was about 11 minutes past 8. Um, the anaesthetist will see the patient in pre-wait rather than going to the ward, so their job plan from 8 o'clock, the first thing they need to do is turn up at PACU, see the patient, assess them, um, and then uh, well, the next part obviously links in with that then is the, the registrar will come up from the trauma meeting rather than the consultant so that we can do the team brief, first thing. Um, so we sort of accepted that the consultant needs to be in the trauma meeting uh, for those discussions, but we can get the senior reg up who can start the procedure to do team brief um, so that we kick off on, on time. Um, so I, and the main thing from a theatre and aspect point of view was that standardisation of the way that we do things so that everyone does it. 
So from a word perspective, we looked how we could improve things, and we've now employed um, three band three senior clinical support workers out of ours, with one of the key aims of their role being optimisation of patients to theatres, um, including being able to do some of the tasks around it with theatre optimisation, cannulas, bloods, ECGs, which we found for some of the delays. They'll visit all patients overnight who are listed for theatre, and ensure all that preparation is done, and they will deal with any outstanding tasks required. They work in conjunction with our medical team overnight, so they ensure all the wards are aware of which patients are listed and where they are on the list, and they'll confirm who's listed first for Theatre 15. As Jonathan said, that's prepared by 5.30, and we agree that this has resolved the issue we found over wards not having access to that list, because they now they get the list and they get told of any changes. Um, I spent some time on the wards working with some of the senior sisters and the nurses clarifying roles and responsibilities and we agreed that it's the responsibility of the night team to prepare a patient, the first patient for theatre, to ensure the paperwork's completed, they're washed, they've had all medications and they're ready to go before that night shift finishes. Um, the nurse in charge then as their first role when they come out of handover will do a final check that everything has been done and they're ready to go. Uh, Jonathan talked about the registrars preparing the list and the senior clinical support worker, if it changes, will also go visit those wards when it changes, which can be because we've had a new admission or a patient's taken unwell and no longer meets that criteria, and then they can go ensure that that patient is now ready. Um, the wards really like what we're doing. They, they prefer the patient being collected earlier. We clarified those roles and responsibilities, but what they also found was previously when we were turning up at sort of ten past, quarter past eight, they were in the middle of their medication rounds for the morning, so they were being disturbed in the middle of that. Now they know the patient's going to be collected before they start the medication rounds. That's over and done with, and then they can go start that and know they're not going to be interrupted, which should also hopefully lead to an improvement in medication rounds on the morning. Okay, so the results then. Um, as a result, the average time that the first patient was sent for um, has moved forward to 7.53. Um, which is an improvement of 39 minutes, so we've moved that significantly further forward. Um, in the first week, Monday to Friday, we achieved uh, an average time of 8.31, um, getting the patient into the anaesthetic room, and actually the range decreased quite significantly, and there were actually a couple of days where it was slightly earlier than the 8.30 start, which is fab. Um, the Sunday to Monday, that was the bank holiday, so you will notice that there is still an improvement, but obviously it's a bit of a slip, um, there were some initial communication issues um, around the theatre team, um, not, not thinking initially that it counted on a weekend, um, and that was a little bit about communication, um, but you know, we've worked on that and improved that moving forward. Um, against our original aims, there were three days where we had four patients that were operated on, um, which was fab, which we weren't achieving consistently before. And actually that week we didn't lose any patients on BPT um, because they weren't operated on in the, uh, in the allocated time frame. Um, so our next steps, we're going to re-audit and obviously continue monitoring our performance, make sure that uh, that week wasn't just a positive blip, that things don't fall back. Um, and then we're going to assess the turnaround times throughout the rest of the list. Obviously we started with the first patient and we need to keep looking at the rest. And then utilise the les lessons that we've learned um, and apply them to some of our other trauma theatres and seeing what else we can do to improve because clearly there's quite a significant improvement um, that we've made. Well, thanks Stephen, uh, Jonathan and uh, Diane. I'm going to save uh, questions uh, to the end but it, uh, it's great isn't it? Uh, on, a, on a Friday seeing a slide that starts with uh, red numbers and ends in green numbers so uh, I'm tempted to close the meeting down now. <laughs> but uh, shall we get to our next uh, presentation? So we're going to look at uh, uh, Value Stream 4 and uh, Rapid Process Improvement Week uh, 3, which is uh, about scheduling. And uh, we've got Danny Wignall. Danny. <coughs> Um, so hi everyone, my name is Danny Wignall, I'm Business Manager for Ophthalmology and Process Owner for the Corneal Clinic Scheduling Week that we did. Um, so just to summarise the project, um, so we did it regarding corneal clinic scheduling. Um, so there was a lot of bottlenecks in those corneal clinics, multiple patients booked in the similar time slots, clinics were overbooked, no space in your waiting room, patients had standing room only, um, specialists ready for patients but patients not ready for specialists and vice versa. 
um, a lot of time was spent looking for supplies and equipment. Uh, there was a lot of interruptions for clinicians asking for advice on patient management, requests from nursing and admin, that sort of stuff. Um, there was no differentiation between new and follow-up appointments, despite different lengths of time patients had to spend with the consultants. Uh, restricted communication due to size and layout of the department. Limited visual control, so people didn't know who was doing what, where and when. Uh, patient notes often in wrong piles and wrong areas. Uh, and patient waste a lot of time walking around the department and waiting with limited communication as what's what going on. Um, so we did a target progress report. Um, I've just picked three areas that I just want to mention. Um, so it's lead time, which is the um, average time a patient spends in, in clinic for a co uh, corneal appointment. Uh, so when we first did the measurement prior to the week, it was 43 minutes 35 seconds. Uh, by the end of the RPIW week, that had actually gone up to 45, sec uh, 45 minutes 47 seconds. Um, and after observations last week, this week even, um, it's down to 37 minutes for a patient now. So we've managed to knock it down by six and a half minutes from the uh, initial baseline figure, which is an improvement of 16%. Um, another one was the WIP, which is the amount of patients currently in the process, sort of checked in, they're awaiting a test, awaiting a review by a clinician. Um, so as baseline was 13 patients, and yesterday when we did the review at the same time, the same day, uh, that was down to 11. So that's another improvement of 16%. Um, and quality as well, uh, which is number eight on there. Uh, so this was interruptions to clinicians during consultations. Uh, so the, uh, when we first started off, there was 30 patients seen and there were 40 interruptions, which was 133%. Uh, Remeasured this week, there was, uh, we just measured 10 patients and there were only three interruptions. So that's down to 78%. So that's another good, good bit of progress. Um, the newspaper. Um, so this was the actions that we came out, so I think we came out with seven different um, things we were going to try to improve things. Um, so everything on this new paper is still remaining work, so uh, we're still keeping everything open and car carrying on with it. Um, probably the biggest impact we've done is the equipment setup. So the trolleys uh, in clinic, uh, previously they were not fully stocked, so now the nurses, uh, Dionis, who's one of the charge nurses, has been really supportive. Um, making sure we've got an itinerary and everything's fully stocked and prepared to prevent the clinicians leaving the room, looking around for equipment, etc. Um, the corneal imaging tray, which is simply a tray we just set up outside the corneal clinic rooms. So if additional tests are required, they can just put the request form in there instead of having to go walking around clinic. Um, so that was uh, made a major impact as well. And Helen and Zoe uh, were really helpful in implementing this. Although over the past week or so, it's gone missing this tray. Um, so we're going to have to try and find that and get back on track with that. Um, barriers, um, there's been a couple of, I won't really say barriers, but a couple of things that um, have not gone to plan. Um, so we did something called a consultant resource, which is where the junior doctors are seeing the patients and the consultants are flitting from room to room offering advice and support. Um, so we had to abandon this mid-clinic mid one day um, due to backup of patients. Uh, and something similar as well, which we've abandoned recently, is um, a Kanban, which is a visual aid. Uh, so Paula, who's sat over there, has been really good at implementing that, and Tara as well. Um, so it's if a junior doctor needs a consultant assistance, instead of knocking on the door and interrupting and delaying everything, they'll leave like a visual, um, it was red on one side and green on another side, uh, so the consultant's aware someone needs some advice. So for the same sort of reasons, due to back up patients, that's kind of been abandoned, but we're going to crack on with it and we're not giving up just yet. Uh, we, another thing, a production board, which will really assist with communication, uh, so people know who's doing what, where and when. Uh, so that's not yet been implemented, but my colleagues Jill and Rachel have agreed to help me getting this up and running, so we're going to do that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so just in summary, uh, so some progress has been made, as you can see from the target progress report. Uh, some of these changes have already produced positive results. Uh, we're going to keep working at this as a team, uh, and I'm confident our results will be even more positive at the next report in 30 days. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. And uh, likewise, if you don't mind, we'll take uh, some of the uh, uh, questions at the uh, uh, at the end. But I, 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 your um, enthusiasm after all of these uh, events is always infectious. So it's uh, <laughs> it's great to come along and uh, hear that progress. Uh, let's move straight into our next one. So we're looking at uh, Value Stream Two and uh, RPIW Five, uh, which is uh, David uh, Golding. We've got uh, David. There we go. Good afternoon, my name is David Golding, Urology Business Manager and Joint Process Owner of this RPIW. Um, brief overview, so the RPIW um, 
back in January was the way that uh, urology schedule their routine inpatients. Most of the time, the average wait time, once hitting an inpatient waiting list for urology patients um, over 18 weeks, was they would wait about 17 weeks from that stage. We've got roughly about 170 routine patients waiting for uh, their procedures. Um, a lot of our sort of um, barriers were around um, the production of the urology rotor, which um, is a is it still, ah, is it still an ongoing issue, but it is improving. Um, the lead clinician produces the urology rotor. It was often produced uh, late, um, giving the admin teams only a week's notice to book inpatients and outpatients. Uh, so on the newspaper, we have um, completed some of our um, tasks on there. We've, um, the rotor is now stored on the G drive. We aimed at the start of the RPIW to have a rolling seven week rotor and then just add a week as each week, week fell off. We're 75% of the way there. We've removed a lot of the waste for the lead clinician by um, ensuring that some of the admin tasks for the rotor are done by admin members of the team. So we're pre-populating the rotor for him with, with bank holidays, the on-call, um, the, the approved annual leave, so all the urology con consultants are now on ESR and requesting the leave through there. Um, we've got as audit days on there, as teaching days and training days, so previously the, these, all these tasks fell down to the lead clinician which was taking up a lot of his time when it came to populating the rotor. So those um, tasks now, have, you know, they've been identified as admin tasks and we're pre-populating those every month for, for him. Um, so what progress have we made in the last 120 days? We identified as part of the RPIW that we should be protecting a list for inpatients at least once a month for his over 18 week patients. So the first list uh, following the RPIW was on the 9th of March. Um, we listed five patients, we gave them six weeks notice, all five patients got treated. Uh, we then the list on the 20th of April went ahead. Um, we listed five patients, gave, gave them the, the notice they required, um, but only three patients were treated. Two patients uh, cancelled themselves, and, and that was at short notice, so we didn't get to fill the rest of that list. Um, the list, uh, the routine list for May is on the 25th of May. Um, we've uh, identified five patients and they've already been contacted and um, agreed to come they will get a phone call 10 days prior to make sure they stop the medication um, we, through working this way we've uh, noticed an improved um, RTT position for urology uh, despite the difficult winter that we've had our inpatient backlog has started to reduce um, so our June rotor um, and routine protective list has been identified and patients have been contacted. So the June, June rotor is out there and is being booked. The July rotor is already in production and we should hopefully have a week or even two weeks out to start booking by the end of next week. Um, this is our production board in, well, I say, I say our production board, it was Jill's, it's now my production board, <laughs> in uh, Paul Sykes. Uh, you can just see on there from April 17 to April uh, 18 how our RTT position has improved and again for where we are in May currently. Also we've included in there our theatre utilisation so you know we are adding those extra patients to our theatre list as well. Um, <clears throat> 5S, um, we were at level 1 for I'd say over two months and I feel now where we are, we're at level three, we've removed a lot of the waste for our lead clinician, we've identified um, items to be pre-populated, we've got SOPs in place for uh, the admin team members that are populating uh, these tasks um, and we've got uh, checks in place with our band four and band, uh, our two band fours in inpatients and outpatients to check once the rotor does go out that we've got you know all the uh, data sessions and uh, clinics filled so the challenges um 
the comp it's really it's been apparent the complexity of the rotor, the admin tasks. Uh, some elements do require uh, a medical input. We need to know um, the days that certain days that the consultants are here when teaching is. So I think we've um, we've identified that now. Um, the impact of last minute unforeseen changes. Something that you know you can't you can't foresee coming. You know people bringing in sick. We've noticed that the junior doctor's uh, on-call rotor can sometimes change at very short notice. It's also been difficult now to try and keep up the momentum of the RPIW uh, when people are back to their normal um, everyday tasks. So it's important that you know we, we still keep plugging away um, and obviously um, continu continuing to improve our RTT performance. So the things we've learned and some of the successes, um, contacting patients 10 days before the TCI has ensured, um, ensuring them to stop the medication has only seen one, one operation since March cancelled uh, for this reason. Um, the support that we've given the lead clinician, uh, I think we're now seeing that benefit um, and especially with the annual leave on uh, ESR, it's giving the team um, greater visual control over what's happening. And we're now giving patients three weeks notice and they're getting the urology experience that, that they deserve really. Um, in fact, finally there's just an uh, AMS Twitter account, I always plug that whilst I'm up here. And I should just say thank you to the uh, admin team in Paul Sykes because I'm the one up here like, presenting today but they're the ones that are constantly churning out the appointments, ringing the patients, especially when the, the rotor was coming out late, they were getting a lot of the grief so thank you to them. Thanks, uh, uh, David. What was, that, what was that Twitter account again? I'll let you put it in the comments. LTH AMS. LTH, at LTH AMS uh, coming in. Jackie Whittle, I'm not, I was just looking around. Oh, she's, she, I was going to see, she's not, she's not there. But uh, um, let's move on to uh, Jackie. You're going to go give us a presentation, some of you, on, well, uh, on, on well, emails. I'm not. Uh, I'm just going to say hello. Thanks, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess um, the team is going to present about emails, but for anybody who works in a clinical role, um, EMEDS has probably been one of the biggest transformational projects that's affected everybody's practice at some point um, because it's about how we've digitalised medicines management um, and that's right from the ordering, the prescribing, the administration and stock control and safety. So the team are going to tell you what they've done. So just to give you an overview, my name is Emma Horton, I'm a senior nurse in EMEDS. And we've also brought along Zoe, one of the sisters from J91, the first ward that helped and was the beacon for this rollout um, of EMEDS in our trust. So just to give a bit of uh, background, in two, 2013, um, Medicines became England's Safe Hospital Safe Awards initiative. Um, LTHT chose uh, CSC, which is now known as DXC, and we procured MedChart. Um, within our trust, we'll either call it MedChart or EMED, it's the same system. Um, so for a year, we had it in the trust, and we did a lot of work in, because every single drug that is in that system, every protocol for all you clinicians that are there, and quick list that are built, our team had to manually do all that work in the system. And um, to improve patient flow and patient safety. We felt that it was really, really important that we built an EDAN as well, which is an electronic discharge note, so that we have known from doing, looking back at some of the research within Blue Sphere that a one particular EDAN can be sent between a pharmacist and a doctor six times before it is finally um, signed off. And one of the common reasons being was that when the doctors write it on a prescription and then they enter it electronically, it doesn't match. So we felt it was really, really important with our colleagues in informatics to build an EDAM within PPM Plus that the medicines magically moved from EMEDS into the EDAM. So it cuts that risk of um, wrong prescribing for the discharge and helps that, that flow of information to help get those patients home quicker. So that took a big, big piece of work to do and it was 
massive. I cannot tell you how much work that the informatics team put into doing that. And I can say we are the only trust in the UK that has MedChart, and there's 11 of us, and in New Zealand, Australia, that have managed to do an integration piece with an EPR system to develop an EDAM. So we did this for a year, so we had it in the trust, and we were really, really busy doing all that work. And I've got to go back to the pilot ward. We chose J91 and they helped and they were integral to all that pieces of work. And Zoe, if you won't mind me saying, also came and did two weeks worth of testing for us. It, they came to informatics and within the first two minutes managed to break it, which was fantastic because that's what we needed because we wanted to break in informatics before we got it out onto the ward. Um, so. Staff and patient involvement was integral. We did so, so much work with all the different staff that we felt would become involved. Right at the beginning, we didn't have e-learning packages. It was face-to-face -face training. So um, myself and our colleagues in the team, for the whole of AMS, everybody in AMS had face-to-face training, be it a pharmacist, a, a nurse, or a prescriber, so anybody that had contact and needed to use that chart. We now do have e-learning packages. And as you can see, you can see how many people to date we have trained um, in using our using the system. And before we had eMeds, we would never have known these figures. We wouldn't have known how many individual doses of medicines that we give to patients, how many medicines that we miss, how many medicines that aren't given for various reasons. So by becoming electronic, we have now an audit trail we can see what medicines we stock in the trust, we can see what medicines our patients are given, if they are given them. And it also, as a patient safety element, it has, we can see allergies. And for the first time in a very long time, we have been looking at our datexes, and in the last quarter, we had no adverse reaction due to an allergy since we've gone live with MedChart. So there are, there's those benefits um, as well. So, Implementation, we felt, so the, the eMeds team is multi, we have informatics with us, we have colleagues that are really, really technical project managers, there's nurses, there's pharmacy staff, and that, I feel, has been really, really important as we've rolled out when we've engaged with all the different CSUs. So for us, we do a lot of work working with uh, specialities and teams to find out what medication do you prescribe in your area? What protocols would make safer prescribing? How can we make the system work well for you? And we spend lots and lots of time with the teams before we even go live planning how they want an implementation. So we do have implementation models, but I would say every CSU we have rolled out to has been completely different because we've had to adapt to their needs and their wants. And I think that has led to why it's been such um, a positive um, rollout. When we first did 20, uh, J91, we actually did 24-7 support. And as we got more confident, that has now split. We do 12 days support to those wards. And there will be a member of the eMeds team on the, each ward that has gone live offering support for 12 days. Um, and I think there's been lots of hesitant, oh, we don't know if we're ready, but that has been the key to the success on um, our rollout. Education and training, we do tailor it, we've got e-learning packages, we still offer face-to-face -face training, and while we're on the wards, we do support um, staff being able to navigate the system. Um, change management, eMeds has shone a light on practices, um, it's really good for that because it's a set way of having to do something. Um, so there's been lots of lessons learned for us as a team, but also for um, change management, how the wards are going to adapt to IT, because for a lot of our nurses, I would say this is the first time they've had to, but three times a day, they're on a long day, actually use technology um, and happen to lo log in themselves, not get somebody else to do it. So we've seen a big shift in staff um, in using and in their involvement within um, IT. We do process mapping, which is always interesting because when we first started to go and they knew that we were there, we'd have beautiful process maps, but now we find that we just pop up and watch a process um, because we did find that people would do a process because they knew they were being watched rather than what was natural for those. Um, and we do, select, uh, we do collect benefits, so we do time and motion 
we record um, a drug round before the implementation of EMEDS and afterwards, and we do prescription audits. Um, and we do survey monkeys so, as well. Benefits, um, so following the Leeds Way, um, we have seen um, an improving in patient safety because prescriptions are legible, we can see who's written them, we can see that audit trail. Um, they don't get lost, they, they're not lost in pharmacy, they're not lost at five o'clock after the doctor's done a ward round and no one can find them. So from a nursing point of view, I think so that was one of your biggest yeah. Um, points. Um, but it's fair, it's in the prescribing we've been able to support our junior doctors in b building our protocol. So at two o'clock in the morning, if you're not sure, there may be a protocol that's standardised across the whole trust to be able to help them in their decision making in picking the medicines. Um, I'm sure a, a few of you are aware that we need to have put a VT alert in the system to try and improve the VT. Um, compliance, so that has been now been put into eMeds, and we have this audit trail not only in the medicines in their prescription, but also in the eDam, which I know a lot of people are now looking back at when we get the um, the complaint complaints in, and it is supporting the pharmacy workflow as well. And then the future. So for the future, we are looking to roll out and create, continue with these improvements in maternity and in A&E and uh, outpatients, as well as the complex infusions. So hopefully with all of that combined, we can then collate all of the improvements that we've made and potentially come back here and, and tell you about it again. Mm -hmm. Has anybody got any questions? I think uh, before we get to Helen on, I think I will just take uh, an opportunity because I had uh, quite a few presentations uh, there. So, I don't know if any questions. We said we'd leave them towards the uh, at the end here. No, you're, you're, you're perfectly fine, prompting me. But, uh, um, so, we've got um, uh, Stephen and Jonathan, I think, as they had to go. Yes, yes, yes yeah. uh, to, to go out. We did the, uh, uh, the stuff in theatres with the uh, Nepotema pathway. Um, then we've got um, Danny that came in in ophthalmology and uh, David Golding, that we just heard from the uh, the EMEDS team. Anyone got any questions you want to ask anyone? Yes, Moira. Um, first of all, it was really, I really enjoyed the presentation about the fraction of academia. It's really good to see a group of people working together to try and solve these problems because they're perennial. Yeah. I just wonder, have you managed to reduce the length of stay of any patients? I think it's worth looking yeah, so we haven't actually managed, uh, we haven't <laughs> monitored it as yet, but potentially that's, that is one of the you overriding know, aims. Getting, you know, getting an opportunity to become unwell. Yeah, after, absolutely. And, might get and go back to theatre or get infected, you know, yeah. infected, etc. Yeah, that's that's part of the kind of next stage. I'm pleased to know uh, Moira is our uh, clinical director uh, in theatre and anaesthetic, so uh, good to see some uh, uh, read across uh, there. I mean, I, I, I was going to ask a question just about the when you put the stats up in terms of the numbers and the the, the sort of red to green in terms of the coming through. Uh, what what's what's the what's the mood feel like in terms of uh, people's interaction with it? Well, from my perspective, from a theatre perspective, it's been one of the few bits of work that I've done that haven't felt like working across a CSU. If that makes sense, because yeah. sometimes you get that whole oh it's us versus them scenario, yeah. and this has really been a core of. Oh, it's just, we're just doing it together, yeah. um, and the fear stuff has been brilliant about the dish. They just get on with it, so yeah. they just, you know, they just said, well, let's just do it. Let's try it. Let's see what see what happens. Um, and the same with the anaesthetists and the surgeons as well. They've yeah. been, they've been fantastic in yeah. just sort of everyone working together to try and try and get on. And likewise, the wards are happy because they're not getting interrupted as much yeah. on during handover in the morning. Um, except, you know, and, and the surgeons are happy because they're starting yeah. on time. Yeah, and good to see that. So the uh, theatre's on the ward end as well as what was happening in terms of the observations. Just one so other question: with the um, with the registrars, do they do they put their list onto TMS? It's the no, so it's not put onto TMS by the registrar. The registrar right. populates what's uh, the QC final list. Um, right. I'm not sure who puts it on. Do they? Uh, check? I, I just want you know to, to learn something for other areas. That's yeah, yeah. Um, it is it's something that we're still looking at. Is the is the final list? Um, because again, reinforcing the sort of first patient criteria, sometimes there's been um, uh, patients who are put on there who need a total hit, which means that the consultant has to come in rather than, um, and on a weekend that causes a few, a few issues. So there's, 
still bits of work to, to go on. I mean, the first thing, that's only one week, it's only that first week sort of data. Um, we'll probably end up coming back, I should imagine, yeah, yeah, no doubt, definitely. and letting you know yeah. what's, Very yeah, <laughs> what's going on in maybe a couple of months yeah. or something like that. That'd be great. Great. Any questions for anyone else? Was that your first, uh, Danny, was that your first RPI? It was, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, how, did, how did you find the process then? Um, I think David touched upon it a little bit, actually. It's, um, everyone's gunning for it and keen to make a difference. Then you kind of fall back into your routine a little bit. So yeah. you need to keep pushing and keep reminding yeah. people and keep being visible um, and getting everybody else who's been involved in the week yeah. to do their little bit as well. So it's, yeah. um, it's a good feel, but it's just you've got to keep pushing. Yeah. So keep that enthusiasm and momentum yeah. in after the week itself back into the workplace. I think that's been a learning from quite a few of the, uh, the weeks, yeah. hasn't it? Any questions for Danny there? Okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask um, what the plan is to reintroduce those elements that kind of dropped off a little bit, much like the um, helicopter. Yeah, off. yeah. Um, so I think we're going to have to try and meet the people we want to pilot this. So the consultant to do the helicopter thing um, and uh, get together with all the juniors, I think, to, to, to do the Kanban thing again. Um, so we, we've tried it. It's not tried once. Let's not just give up just yet. Let's, let's try again on a different day. <laughs> See what what do you think could make it work? So get some feedback. I guess it's quick, too easy to just abandon. I think um, after all that work and ideas that come out of it, so we'll keep at it. Thanks, Danny. Any more there? Or any questions for uh, David? 120 days in. <laughs> <laughs> any questions there? Now, or the EMEDS team. It was, it was really nice actually to see the, uh, the way you put the uh, the benefits in line with the organisational <laughs> values of you know. Uh, patient-centred, fair, caring, collaborative was uh, really good. Any, any questions there? So is it Irma and Zoe? Has, has Zoe gone as well? She's gone back to the ward. Oh, gone back to the ward, yes, yes, busy that times. Anything on emails? Uh, some great stuff there. Let me move us on then to our next presentation. So uh, Helen's been doing the uh, advanced uh, lead training, and uh, I think at the end of that process now, uh, Helen, and we have just to share a, a few thoughts on your uh, your learning. The last hurdle, I think, of ALT. <laughs> they don't tell you this bit at the beginning, <laughs> is what I would say. Um, so, um, hello, my name is Helen Rolley. I am the general manager for the Head and Neck CSU. Um, I uh, was lucky enough to do the ALT course, and I started in February, and it completed in April. Um, it's a it's a pretty big whirlwind, I think it's fair to say, and it's one of those that you kind of know what you think you're going to do, but actually, until you get given your agenda and then the amount of homework you actually you think, oh, that's not long to do this course at all. Um, I would say, just in the corner there, the coloured pens, it's amazing how excited people do get <laughs> about stationery in our organisation. Um, it's one of the key elements of success, I think, is your coloured pens. Um, so it's been probably one of the hardest presentations I've ever put together because there has been so much impact from this course for me personally. So I've chosen, I've only got three minutes by the way, so I've chosen just three things just to really pick up that um, probably had the most impact for me. Um, boundaries is something that throughout the course we learn around boundaries and I think having done project management things before in the past you think you know what you're going to do and you turn up with your ideas and realise that your boundaries are a million miles apart. And I think having nine weeks to do your homework, um, it really does focus your mind on where your boundaries really should be. And I think one of the things that I really learned, I changed my boundaries on my value stream three times before I actually started because it's so overwhelming to get that project up and running and to understand if you're really going to make a difference, actually, you just need to make the very first small step to get going. And I think once you do that, you soon realize um, that you can then extend your boundaries further down the line. Um, and I think non-value added activities was something that um, really resonates with me. I think it resonated a lot with my colleagues who did the course. And it's something that um, we discussed probably every single hour of that course that, um, that we were in the classroom for, around how much value do we actually add during the activities that we do every single day in our job. I think as, um, from a managerial perspective, we spend a huge amount of time at our computers, at, in meetings, 
and I think we really need to challenge ourselves as an organisation and as individuals how much value some of those activities actually give back to the care that we provide to our patients. One of the things that I noticed during the value stream, timing uh, one of our members of staff, was the amount of time she spent writing out emails to people and we asked her to go away and ask who reads it. Um, and I have to say the answers weren't great in terms of, you know, this is a generated email to a group of people and lots of them just filed it, I think it's fair to say. So lots of time on her behalf, actually not really adding a huge amount of value to that process along the way. Um, and I think that's something that we will certainly take away in our practice to change what we do in the future. And then 5S. So um, the picture there is emails. Drowning in emails, if you Google it. Um, one of my personal um, frustrations is around the amount of emails we generate as an organisation. And part of, you know, I receive between 80 and 100 a day. Um, and it's really, really difficult to keep on top of that proactively. So I thought, I'll do my 5S on my inbox. This will be all right. Um, I'm still in box one, level one. <laughs> uh, I think it's fair to say I am three months down the line and I'm, I think I'm still in that first box because it's a moving feast. It is continually arriving day in, day out, day in, day out. So the 5S, there's a, there's a lot of perseverance that needs to go into 5S. Um, I am absolutely determined to get to level two. <laughs> there's no two ways about it. Um, but it is one of those things, I think, when we hear about people doing 5S, it applies to everybody in the organisation. Um, but the perseverance to actually get through those all five boxes on level one to get to level two, it shouldn't be underestimated, I think. And if, I think if we're supporting staff going forwards, we need to perhaps just bear that in mind about the support they may actually need. So how am I going to put my learning into practice? I think being the GM, it's in my gift to encourage not only just all of the members of our CSU to learn this methodology, but obviously to um, all of the colleagues that I come into contact with day in, day out. Um, it is something that I think really resonates of how we can share a common language and a common way of doing something. And actually, you get really good results from very simple things, which is really nice. And to share those experiences, um, it's been really heartwarming to listen. Certainly in our ALT room, we got quite giddy by the end of the first week. But it's really nice to hear about the experiences that people have and the really small things that they've gone on to change. And to really share that, it resonates a lot of the time with a lot of people so that we can really share that learning. And to celebrate the small wins, um, there are some very small wins. I've managed to sort one channel in my e inbox. It's still working, which is really great. And I actually, it's made a huge difference to me because it's the one email contact that actually, for my job, is the one I need to pay the most attention to. So to celebrate the small wins as you go and to really congratulate team members on that perseverance. <coughs> It's really nice to hear the value stream work. It's really hard and you know that momentum keeping it going is really difficult. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, we have to celebrate uh, big wins as well. So uh, I, get the, uh, I get the opportunity of giving you a uh, certificate uh, which we've got. Yeah. There it is. Thank there we you. Go. And so I have to come here to uh, <laughs> make, sure, make sure there's an appropriate so I can see uh, the local directors uh, uh, here as well. So congratulations. Thank you. Forget that. Uh, if anyone could get those pictures to the comms team, I'm hoping to win the competition of uh, most pictures in Salt Lake. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to everything this week. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, keep on persevering with that uh, 5S. David, I think that uh, yours at level 3 was. Was it yours yeah, at level 3? Yeah, it was at level 1 for quite a, a long time. Yes. For the, well, for the last three reports, I was really. It's only yeah. over these 
last couple of weeks we haven't done it. Yeah, uh, pushed it up that level. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think on the presentations, that's the, the highest I think we've seen some of those. So it is hard work, isn't it, to persevere yeah. and keep on going, which is the, the point that Danny was making. Um, right, any final uh, questions or observations before I send you on your way? Uh, Julian was watching on YouTube. He was watching on YouTube, uh, was he? I've, I've got, ha did Helen get to join us as well? Uh, they're still watching on YouTube, yes, I believe. They've gone. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Star of the Week and YouTube star. <laughs> uh, have a good week, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for coming along. Thanks, now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.